This is the largest airplane ever built, the Hughes Flying Boat, nicknamed the Spruce Goose. Its strange and controversial career and its unique size and design have guaranteed it a permanent place in aviation history. It was test flown once in 1947 with designer and builder Howard Hughes at the controls. The flight lasted less than a minute. The plane never flew again. The Spruce Goose was maintained in this storage hangar in Long Beach, California, and hidden from view for 33 years. Hughes died in 1976. At last, it seemed the marvelous flying boat might have to be dismembered, with sections slated for display in several museums. But the outcome was a happy one. The Rather Corporation, in an agreement with the Aero Club of Southern California and the Suma Corporation, stepped in and saved the great airplane. A huge dome was built to house it alongside the Queen Mary in Long Beach. A flyover of famous old aircraft was part of the opening day celebration for the Spruce Goose attraction on May 14, 1983. Bonita and Jack Rather officiated at the ceremonies, and actor Jimmy Stewart cut the ribbon. The permanent home of the Spruce Goose is in every way suitable for the mighty seaplane. It too is unique, the largest freestanding geodesic dome ever built. It's as tall as a 13-story building and 415 feet in diameter. The chronicle of Howard Hughes, the legendary and eccentric character who designed, built, and flew the Spruce Goose, is as remarkable as that of the great airplane itself. Howard Robard Hughes was born in Houston, Texas in 1905. His father amassed a fortune by inventing and marketing a unique oil drilling bit. Young Howard also showed a remarkable mechanical aptitude, even fitting a motor to his bicycle. Then at the age of 19, he inherited the Hughes Tool Company, and for the rest of his life, he was a wealthy man. Hughes moved to Los Angeles, determined to become a movie producer. After a modest start, he undertook an epic film about the flyers of World War I and collected a fleet of authentic fighter planes. The film was ready for release when talking pictures became a reality. Hughes reshot his movie in sound. Hell's Angels, released in 1930, cost an unprecedented six million dollars. It was an instant hit and is now a screen classic. Hughes was a born showman, and more great films followed, including Scarface and The Front Page. But he had another passion, flying. He broke several long-distance speed records, and in 1937, he flew coast to coast in just under seven and one half hours. This is the H1 racer that he designed and flew. President Franklin D. Roosevelt presented him with the Harmon Trophy, and Hughes had become as famous a flyer as Charles Lindbergh. A replica of his H-1 racer is on display next to the Spruce Goose. In 1939, Hughes flew around the world in a Lockheed Lodestar. He reached Paris here in half the time Lindbergh had needed 11 years before. Hughes continued eastward with refueling stops and returned to a ticker tape parade in New York. He had circled the globe in less than four days. It was a new record. After Japan's surprise attack on Pearl Harbor and America's entry into World War II, industrialist Henry J. Kaiser proposed a fleet of huge seaplanes for transporting troops and supplies to far-off battle zones. Nazi U-boats had been sinking scores of Allied supply vessels, but these cargo planes would be able to fly far above that danger. Kaiser joined forces with Howard Hughes, who also had an eye for grand enterprises, and they secured a government contract to design and build the plane. Hughes put his engineers to work. At Culver City, California, Hughes built a special hangar in which the giant plane could be constructed. The unprecedented size of the flying boat meant that new tools and techniques had to be devised, and the work progressed slowly. Hughes, always a perfectionist, 
personally oversaw even the tiniest details. Because of the wartime shortage of metals, the plane had to be fabricated entirely of wood. Birch was selected and was shaped, laminated, and bonded through a unique process that produced a smooth, hard outer surface. Kaiser left the project, and by the time the war ended in 1945, military urgency for the giant flying boat had long since vanished. But Hughes, convinced that his unique plane was important for aeronautical research, spent more than seven million dollars of his own money on its completion. In June 1946, the plane's hull and two wing sections were moved to Long Beach for final assembly and for the eventual flight testing of the seaplane in the harbor. The 28-mile route from Culver City was carefully mapped out. Roads and bridges were checked for strength. Trees were trimmed, power lines raised. The move took five days. As the immense components were slowly transported toward Long Beach, 100,000 spectators lined the route, and children in nearby schools were recessed from class to watch. During the war, Hughes had also secured a government contract for a photo reconnaissance airplane, the XF-11. His customary perfectionism again delayed the work, and it was 1946 before the prototype was completed. On July 7th, Hughes flew it through a variety of tests. A propeller abruptly malfunctioned and the plane crashed in Beverly Hills. Hughes was nearly killed. His injuries would cause him pain the rest of his life. Work continued on the giant flying boat. It was to be powered by eight radio Pratt & Whitney engines. Critics claimed the huge plane would never fly, but Hughes pursued his own convictions as usual. He projected a cruising speed of 200 miles per hour. Like any other prominent figure, Hughes had made political enemies. His flying boat still had not flown, and he was accused of having profited from his wartime contracts. In August 1947, he was summoned before a Senate investigating committee. Although he made a masterful presentation of his case, his untried wooden seaplane was derisively called a flying lumberyard of the spruce goose. Hughes was later entirely vindicated, but those nicknames rankled. He pushed his big plane to completion. Stan Soderberg, now custodian of the spruce goose, went to work for Howard Hughes on the airplane in 1946. When I was hired on, it was uh, a job that was called a, tr a trimmer, which entails uh, working with fabric. I was a parachute rigger in the Navy, and so it was parallel to that. On November 2, 1947, the Spruce Goose was towed out into Long Beach Harbor. Thousands of spectators lined the shore. Hughes announced he would not try to fly the plane then. This would be a taxi test only. Flight testing would come the following year. At this time, there were 32 people on board the plane, including seven news reporters chosen by lottery. A hydraulics engineer sat at Hughes' right side. The flying boat was so big that for the first time in history, muscle power alone was not enough to manipulate the controls of an airplane. The hydraulic system that was used multiplied the pilot's strength 200 times. The first taxi run was at 45 miles an hour. Hughes swung the plane around and taxied a second time at 70. On the third run, he called for 15 degrees flaps, pushed the eight engines to full throttle, and the largest airplane ever built lifted off the water. It flew about a mile and reached an altitude of 70 feet. It was one of aviation's truly epic flights. Stan Soderberg was in a launch nearby. He describes the start of the third run. We were laying off the side of the airplane, and it was laying dead in the water, and uh, he only had one engine running at the time. He cranked them all up, and the flaps come down, and 
and he gave her throttles, and as it picked up speed, it's up on the step and away she went. How did you feel when the big plane lifted off? My personal feelings were like you made the winning touchdown in the Rose Bowl. We were all very happy and excited for Mr. Hughes and for those of us that had worked on the airplane for the previous year. Afterwards, when Hughes was asked why he changed his mind and actually took off, he said in the characteristic understatement, I like to make surprises. Did Hughes plan all along to fly that day? Only Mr. Hughes knows that, but probably in the back of his mind he thought about it, but I know that he didn't want to kill himself and a bunch of people to prove a point, but I feel after the uh, first slow run and the second high-speed run that everything felt good to him and on the third one when uh, he put the flaps down there there was no doubt about it in in anyone's mind that knew anything about this airplane the surprise takeoff was not only a personal triumph for Hughes it was convincing proof that such gigantic cargo planes were practical after all but there was no longer a military urgency for his giant flying boat and Hughes eventually returned to movie making and then more and more to commercial aviation The popular outcry that arose when it was thought the Spruce Goose might be dismembered proved that the great seaplane had long since established its own special place in the affections of people everywhere. As soon as it was placed on public view, it became one of the most popular attractions in the country. Years before this time, the nickname Spruce Goose had become a universal term of endearment. On the point of accuracy, however, the name is an error, because the only spruce used in its construction is a small amount in the wing spars. So that visitors can inspect the Spruce Goose close up, stairways and viewing platforms have been built on one side up to the level of the cockpit and the flight deck. Up here, close to the mighty engines, it's possible to appreciate something of their enormous size and power. The four-bladed propellers are 17 feet long. The Spruce Goose could carry enough gasoline to drive the average modern family car around the world 15 times. In the pilot seat is a startlingly lifelike mannequin of Howard Hughes, dressed as he was on the day of the momentous flight. Hughes followed an individualistic approach in virtually every project he undertook, and he always preferred to act as his own test pilot. He once said, why should I pay somebody else to have all the fun? Viewing windows have been cut into the side of the plane to give visitors a chance to see the instrument panels and the passenger seats located midships on the flight deck. There were two flight engineers on duty during the flight of the Spruce Goose. Part of their job was to monitor fuel and oil and to be certain the engines responded to the pilot's commands. With eight Pratt & Whitney's to oversee, they were busy men. The crew could enter the wing from the flight deck for in-flight inspection and adjustment of the engines. The wing, here at the point where it joins the hull, measures 13 feet between its top and bottom surfaces. On the next level, below the flight deck, is the cavernous cargo hold. This is the view looking toward the tail. The red tanks are CO2 bottles for use in the fire control system. Here, visitors are able to enter the flying boat itself and inspect the cargo area from an interior viewing enclosure. The design payload of the Spruce Goose was 200,000 pounds, equal to its own weight. It was to provide fast and safe transportation for either 750 fully outfitted combat troops or two tanks. This was far greater than any cargo ever dreamed of for an airplane up to that time.
An authentic Sherman tank, model M4A1, widely used in World War II, is on display inside the dome next to the Spruce Goose. The aircraft was designed to carry two of this type of medium tank. At one time, the nose of the plane had clamshell doors to permit cargo loading directly into the hold. But before the test flight, they were replaced with a present solid nose. One of the most exciting added attractions at the Spruce Goose is the light show. Computer-operated banks of 1,000-watt floodlights in white, royal blue, red, amber, and peacock blue bathe the seaplane in ever-changing splashes of vivid color. The tints are produced not by the usual gelatin filters, but by stained glass. The light show offers special fun for the color photographer. The entire program of colored lights runs about 10 minutes and alternates with a three minute interval of steady white illumination when all the lights are on full. There's a cutaway engine on display that turns in slow motion to demonstrate its operation. Visitors are always impressed with the fact that these engines, built well before the jet age was born, are rated at over 3,000 horsepower each, and the plane has eight of them. From nose to tail, the Spruce Goose is more than 218 feet in length. wings stretch 320 feet from tip to tip, longer than a football field. The plane is so big, in fact, that the only real way to appreciate its enormous size is through comparisons. Here are two. A DC-10 could be parked under each of these giant wings. The flying boat's horizontal tail surface is longer than the entire wingspan of a Boeing 727 and the vertical fin rises 80 feet above the ground. One of the early design proposals called for twin hulls, but that was rejected in favor of a single fuselage. The goose still rests on the same cradle on which it was stored for so many years. The reflecting pool here greatly enhances the beauty and drama of the setting. Besides the plane itself, the dome contains many exhibits relating to the goose and to Howard Hughes. Several short audiovisual programs offer a wealth of interesting background information. There's also a well-stocked gift shop and a convenient snack bar. The Spruce Goose and the man who built and flew it are each one of a kind, authentic examples of American inventiveness and enterprise. Here, in the glare of floodlights, the plane exerts a strong and mysterious fascination, just as Hughes himself did when he was in the public eye. Everyone who visits the Spruce Goose and the Queen Mary as well nearby should remember that in each case it was literally an 11th hour rescue that preserved them from destruction. Now with so many people visiting and enjoying them every day, it scarcely seems possible that we nearly lost them both. The Spruce Goose and the Queen Mary, two of mankind's great triumphs of technology, are now neighboring giants here in Long Beach. Companion attractions presented by Rather Port Properties Limited. Their final home is a happy one.
Howard Hughes, a master showman with an eye for grand enterprises, would still feel very proud of his famous flying boat. <laughs>